All right. We're here with Carla Easton. How are you doing today, Carla? I'm very well. How are you? Yeah, I'm doing all right, you know. Your record. I love it. Like, first off, where did all this energy come from? I mean, this is a huge pop record, like with pop in all capitals. Like, um, I guess just maybe what I've been listening to a lot over the last couple of years and just um, there's quite a few songs on it that are co-writes with my friend Scott and we both just wanted to kind of like push working in pop sounds just like drums and synths and um, yeah and then it just kind of became this sound it's I guess a different band and producer from my last album and I don't really like just doing the same thing all the time so I wanted to learn new things myself and um, with Impossible Stuff, it was all written on the piano. So um, with Weirdo, I really sort of influenced a lot of the sounds. Okay. What have you been listening to the past couple of years? Um, what have I been listening to? I'd say this really, question, I know. <laughs> I, know I was really into uh, Lily Allen's album, No Shame. Um, which I got at sort of like around April last year after reading her biography. And I just loved the sort of textures on that and how it was very much a pop record, but dealing with quite sort of like complex lyrics. So I felt like I could really relate to that. And then Secret, I went to see her at um, Lusher Hall in Edinburgh last year and was kind of blown away and quite excited about how pop music can sort of, you know, like it used to feel like, you know, if you said you were pop, it was quite a dirty word to say, whereas it feels like there's a new generation coming through that are sort of saying embrace it. And I've never believed that pop's a, a bad word, you know? Um, so yeah, I was quite influenced by them, but also just like my record collection, you know, got a lot of new order in it and um kind of a mix of yeah like pure pop and indie pop and but mostly it was just sort of getting into like vintage drum beats really and sort of writing around that um which i find really good in developing a new sound that way you know yeah what's your favorite new order record um I'm definitely a singles person in terms of like lots of bands I like and with New Order for me it's Your Silent Face. Oh, that's so good. I think I'll forever spend my life trying to replicate that synth sound at the start of it. Oh that's yeah that's wonderful and that whole record is great. Oh man. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you were saying it's a you know it's a lot different than Impossible Stuff, which it, it really is. Like I wouldn't have expected what I'm hearing on Weirdo, like that sort of trajectory from where you're going from the last record. When did you sort of come up with the direction? Um, it was actually just before I went to record Impossible Stuff in Montreal. I had the studio with Stephen Watkins in Glasgow and recorded two songs and. One of them is Touching the Sky, which was the B-side to my single Get Lost, and the other one was Thorns. And I just thought Thorns is the best song that we've ever done together. Like, we've been working together on and off for about 10 years since Teen Canteen, and as a producer, Stephen really encouraged me to write, push my limits, both vocally with my voice, what I'm doing, or lyrically, or soundscaping. Um, as soon as I did it, I was like, this is not for the Impossible Stuff album. But also at the same time, I was like, this is the end of my next album, it's you know? Song, was, yeah. <laughs> totally, like, it's, and it was always in my mind, no matter what we were recording, you know, and some of the boys in my band would be like, that's the album closer. And I was like, no, it's not. I've already got the album closer. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, I guess it was just like, as a solo artist, I'd never worked with Steven. I'd worked with him with Team Canteen. So, and also it's interesting because working with Steven, I could go into the studio just myself and do a whole track. So like spun out, I'd done the demo for it in my lockup, just using a cheap 58 and a shitty PA system and recorded that into my iPad and took it into the studio with Steven. And 
we, we just did the track using the stems that I'd already created and and then I just had to have the vocal and the same with Beautiful Boy, like um, we'd been in the studio quite late the night before, so my band had all slept in, we'd all had some drinks, so I turned up at the studio early and Stephen was like, what have you got? It's a programmed in this vintage drum beat and then just pulled out my synth and did that squelchy bass sound that immediately introduces it. So it's actually um, amazing to think what you can do on your own and and to have the 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 fun to do that and then your band turn up and they're like, okay, like what do what do we where do we go from here? This is not how we thought that was gonna sound, you know? Um so yeah, just uh in many respects I think because weirdo a lot of the tracks are just me and Stephen and maybe a guitarist or a lot of the tracks are just me and Scott from writing. Um it, it's maybe more all the signs in my head stuff I love the people I made it with and it, I mean it was a snapshot in time and that record couldn't have been made any other way but Weirdo was just like if I think of impossible stuff as the record I needed to make Weirdo is just the sound of me having as much fun as possible in a studio excellent yeah it's, it well it is a fun record but it also it's intense at points yeah. I mean, a lot of it was written last year and I find myself in the position after a relationship ended where I was homeless for quite a few months and just sort of like being on sofas or blow up beds or spare rooms waiting for a flat. And um, so I guess it, there's definitely a lot of anger in that record and kind of working stuff out, but in a kind of hopefully kind of defiant way you know like not letting the anger get the best of me and kind of working out all those kind of complicated feelings at the time mm. sign it in blood which is one of my favorites on the album it's gorgeous but it's also i mean just the phrase is intense yeah <laughs> and, uh, i mean there's i think there's like a, an undercurrent of that where it's like you can get so into something so quickly and so obsessively that i just destroy it in the end and and signing it in blood's maybe like the perfect example of that. It's like I'm all in. <laughs> Excellent. So what's it like putting out a record in these crazy times? It's it's strange and I was quite like tentative about doing it. Um I mean it finished the album in February, the beginning of February got the masters back and it was like oh, okay, you know, what will we do with it? And like yeah, my manager was just like, my manager's great. He's this guy called Davey Miller who was in a techno band called Finny Tribe who did like Peel Sessions. They were like one of Scotland's first techno bands. He's really sound, just a really great guy. And he was like, okay, let's just release it, you know, but let's just go for it. You've got a finished album. And I was like, okay, because the thing is, it's like, you can't just sit on it and wait and go, okay, I'll release it when touring will happen because we don't know when that's going to be, you know, and... I, 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 for me, when I finish an album, when you know I can hold the vinyl in my hands, and then it's like, right, okay, that's a finished piece, and then you have like maybe a year of playing it live and celebrating it and stuff like that. And I really, really hope I get to play this album live with my band because we've been rehearsing it just before lockdown, and it was sounding great, you know, taking all these synth sounds and transforming them into this like okay, it's a five-piece band that's got bass and guitar and a couple of synths and SPD pads and drums and, like, you know, it was, like, still sounded like the album, but it was, like, a different version of it. It was, like, the live version of it. And mm. there's a lot of tracks on this album that I'm just desperate to play in, like, a small dive basement dingy venue, you know, where it's too hot and sticky and... But yeah, I just kind of thought, release it. And then you're like, is anyone going to notice? Because gigging is such a big part of promoting an album or even being able to go and do a, a live radio session and you can't even do stuff like that. So it's like, is anyone even going to notice that my album's come out? But I mean, I don't know if it's because of off the back of my last album where that placed me, but the support's been genuinely insane. Um it's the fastest selling record that Olive Grove Records have ever done. Um, 
I've never sold out a solo album before release date, the vinyl. Lloyd's never on Olive Grove Records. We're doing a repress and it's insane. Oh, that's awesome. Like, the album's only been out for a week and I've already announced the repress of it. And I just, yeah, I really hope I get to, to tour it and play it live because I really love this record, you know? Mm. It's kind of like a party record that's kind of like, needs to be loud and yeah. so that we can all dance and stuff. I know I saw that on Twitter today about uh, the repressing. It's got different cover art. Mm-hmm. Tell me about yeah, that. Yeah, I think, well, I just thought, you know, like, if I'm going to do a repress, well, I'm not really a believer in just repressing it when it's the same cover but a different vinyl color, you know what I mean? I know a lot of people do that, but I kind of thought, okay, I've got this opportunity, like I've made a profit on my album, what will I use the money on? And then I was like, well, I want to make, I mean, I went to art school, so I thought I want to make something really special for the repress, you know? Um, so I approached Jim Lambie, who's like one of my favorite artists of all time, and was just like, do you want to collaborate on the, the album artwork? And he said, yes. And I was like, okay, bucket list. <laughs> But I wouldn't have been in this position if people hadn't bought the original version of it. And I'm so thankful for that. And, you know, I mean, there's I've had a few tweets being like, oh, why was this not the first version? And I was like, because it wasn't planned. Like, <laughs> we're in the uncharted territory here. Like, you know, I'm sort of prepping for the fact that if I do tour, I need to have merch to sell to break even on those gigs or like make a profit. But also it's like, okay, what can I do? I'm stuck at home. I can't tour. I can't gig. Like, let's just make a really cool repress of the vinyl. And, you know, I'm really excited about it. I think it looks amazing. I'm really honoured to have my face in a Jim Lambie artwork. (laughs) And, um, yeah, it's just just another nice part of the, the story for me. Like, it's an album that at the beginning of the year, it wasn't even finished. And now it's coming out and, you know, it's like a version with one of my favorite artists of all time. And, you know, it's just, it's just the journey of weirdo. (laughs) Yeah, you were saying about you're hesitant. And I know lots of artists were, but for me, I have been so thankful these past six months or whatever that there has been new music coming out. Because it's just so great to, you know, have that with all the rest of the and Do you know, sometimes I think you can forget. Because I was talking to a friend who's based in Canada. And she was like, what's the point in me finishing my album right now? Like, what's the point in me going through all these mixes and all that? And I was like, because I think sometimes you forget. Like, okay, you know, you, you're crafting your work and you, you love what you do. And it's hard work and you're thinking about the project. But a lot of people view you as it's your job to entertain. And when everyone's stuck at home, yeah. you know, entertain and provide escapism because real life's pretty shit right now, you know? Mm. I, well, no, <laughs> let's not get down. This is a great party yeah, record, as you said. I've certainly enjoyed um, new releases that have come out. Like I love the Heim record and Lady Gaga's record and Taylor Swift dropping the unexpected album. Like it's definitely kept me going having new music in my life, you know? I saw one of your posts that was, uh, you were debating which version of Taylor Swift to buy. Yeah, I know. It's like, ah, what one will I do? Like, and then... Yeah, I settled on one version, and I'm, I'm glad I picked that. I'm glad that the option to decide was only a week long, because, like, about a week after, I was like, oh, I wish I'd bought that one as well. So, <laughs> I don't know. What, what are your favorite tunes off our new record? I mean, I really think Cardigan was just such a great single choice, because the melodies on it are brilliant. And um, I love Betty's Garden, you know? It's kind of like that old school country Taylor Swift that's just to die for. Um, as a whole piece, it's great. And like the more I listen to it, like certain songs will stand out for me. And um, I find that interesting. I was like, oh, it's your indie record. Because to me, the melodies and the hooks are still so pop, you know? Oh, yeah. Like, a turn of phrase or, or a lyric. And um, I mean... I guess because it's what 
there's some guitars on it, but there's guitars on our previous <laughs> albums that are just mixed in with the synths, you know, and, and it's still, it's pop. And then it's like, oh, you know, someone from the national produced it, so that makes her credible. And I'm like, bullshit. Like, she's one of the greatest pop artists of all time. And I'm lyricist. Like, her lyrics and songwriting are just genius. And, you know, when you watch that documentary about her and just you see how quickly she comes up with ideas and they're great. And, you know, she's just one of the best, songwriters of the 21st century if not of, of all time you know i would put it up there i think it's great and i, I love this record mm. don't know if it's my favorite taylor swift record but i love it <laughs> hand on heart completely honest the first time i listened to weirdo when yeah. uh never knew you came on i actually looked up to see if my itunes had started playing taylor swift by mistake yeah, yeah, thank it's, you <laughs> it's very <laughs> well done even before the ever, ever line that you say. I know, we like, say like, we were right next, I call it that with Scott, and uh, obviously he's from his band, his sons and daughters, and then he's toured with the Kills for a, bit, well, a lot of years, so there were some points where we were writing certain tunes in the album where he was like, am I having a midlife crisis? And I was like, no, it's great. If this is the sound of your midlife crisis, I'm on board with that. <laughs> Excellent. Tell me about that tune. I uh, never knew it was just like, it was actually, so there's four songs we co-wrote an album together. It's Get Lost, Heart So Hard, Never Knew You, and Over You. And Get Lost and Heart So Hard came so quick. Like we took them down in a day, but it was Never Knew You took a bit more like thought, a bit more kind of like rewriting and, and kind of working out the story and, you know, it was that kind of way, like, how personal do you want to go with the lyrics? And also for a song that's so, like, up and, and quite happy and in a major key, it's like, well, how do you write something that's quite sort of sad to that and, and retain those feelings? And I think the bit for me that I, I crack, cracked it was um, when I came up with the middle eight and I went into Scott and I was like, I've got the middle eight and it ties it all together, you know, and it's the taking the nursery rhyme and just sort of switching it around. So it's like the, to the tune of the grand old Duke of York, you know, and when they were up, they were up and, and when they were down and I was like, well, what if it's when, when I was up, I was up, but when I was down, you never were around. And, and then um, it just sort of changed the tone of the chorus to be like, well, I didn't know you, but never mind, because you weren't actually there for me at all, you know? And it was just this kind of like, yeah, we can we can keep it as this up-tempo thing, because there's so many like, is this a ballad? You know, <laughs> like, really try to work it out. And then, yeah, it just felt like we totally just cracked it. And then it was like, okay, great. <laughs> Excellent. And the video is fantastic. Yeah, the video was a lot of fun to make. Obviously, like in lockdown, you were quite restricted. And at that point, you couldn't have friends indoors, but you could meet up in a park. So I asked Sita, who was the bassist in Teen Canteen, she's a performance theatre artist. I was like, oh, I'm making these masks. Will you like do some movement in them? And, you know, it was just like, how can we make this look high budget when actually it's just filmed in my partner's living room in a, a tenement flat in Glasgow, you know? Um, so it was like, oh, what costumes can I get? And things like that. And um, in a way, it was like entertaining me as well, you know? Hmm. Well, did you do the Get Lost video before lockdown or after? That was during lockdown as yep. well. So that, that was in a corner of my partner's kitchen. Because it was like, what are we going to do? And I was like, he had some lights. And I was like, I'm just going to buy 200 balloons and a balloon pump. And uh, it was at that time, just before lockdown, and everyone was sort of panic buying toilet roll and pasta. And I was like, I'm going to buy balloons in case I need to do some sort of like video or something. And I think a lot of my friends thought I was losing my mind. But um, yeah, again, it was just like, it's funny. And, you know, it's that way when you're writing a song, like, See, when you've got restrictions and what's available in the studio, 
you're like, okay, how do I use this and how do I push it? Like the start of Get Lost is on an old Casio MT45 keyboard that's about what? 50 centimeters in length, very limited in the tones, but Scott had this echo loop pedal and we just stuck it through that and it was like, oh, that sounds like that's the opening of the song, you know, and it was that way, it was like, great, I've got lights and some balloons and a wig. I need to make a video, you know? Yeah, balloons are just so pop. Exactly. <laughs> I really liked on Get Lost how first song on the record you had the uh dreaming on the run line back to the first song mm-hmm. on the first record well done. thank you i like when bands do that <laughs> um the title track tell me yes. about this one probably my other favorite on the record uh we do i think just sums up for me all the themes and where i was at last year um i wrote weirdo Again, on my Casio MT45, just finally moved into my flat, finally had a home after all these months, and I've got a desk, and the wall in front of my desk is full of postcards, and photos, and drawings, and ticket stubs, and things, I call it my inspiration wall, and I was just sitting looking at it, and how in my previous relationship, it had been like, oh, you're so weird for all the things you have. Like, you're so weird for those drawings or you're so weird for these old toy keyboards or, you know, you're so weird for the way you dress and how it was, like, used as a really derogatory word against me. And it really, really affected me because when someone that is meant to be close to you turns around and sort of, like, slams every sort of part of of you Mm and it's unexpected it really knocks you for six and I just wanted to I was like why do we say like don't be weird when you're talking about things that someone loves or you know things someone's like I'm not really massively concerned about the fact that I'm wearing a colorful jumper that my niece bought me or something because it makes her happy to to see me wearing it and then put a photo on it so of on social media so she can see how people react so that's not weird to me that's just I love my niece and yeah. I'm just sharing a gift she's given me or you know like collecting 1985 first edition Hasbro Gem and the Hologram dolls because <laughs> when I was four that was the first time I saw an old girl band on screen and the, lead, the songwriter in the band was the keyboard player, Kimber. So then I got a keyboard and then I became a songwriter. So for me to be able to afford the first session of, of Heart and then branch out and be like, you know, I'll get the whole collection to me. That's a marker of where I started and how it ended up being such a big influence. And so I just kind of thought, fuck that. You know, like, I'm That's not, not weird. Saying, That's fucking awesome. <laughs> weird. And, and, you know, a lot of the friends I have around me, I love their little quirks and idiosyncrasies, you know, and their confidence to let that part of their personality come through, through the clothes they wear or the books they read or the pictures in their walls. So weirdo was just kind of like my, yeah, you know what? I am a weirdo and I'm just flying away because I don't need you in my life and I don't need you to say these things to me. And and then Stina was re- rehearsing with Honey Blood around the road for me when I was recording it. And, we'd kind of become friends over the year and she was like oh can I come down the studio and see how you're doing I was like yeah and I was like I just, like, got this song I was like you're a weirdo too you know <laughs> like let's unite in our weirdness and she was just like yeah do you know what it's a great song and I get the point of it and um it's just really nice to to have something to create something with a peer you know, who can like does her own thing as well and doesn't really give a shit what people think about it. And it is this statement of, yeah, I'm a weirdo. I'm a cherry bomb exploding. Deal with it, you know? Life would be very boring if people weren't quote unquote weird. <laughs> exactly, right? Yeah. Man. So did you have feel a great sense of vindication when you, you had the record in your hand? Yeah, massively. I mean, it's like some of sometimes I'm just like all the song titles and the lyrics, and I'm like, wow, that's a year's worth of therapy right there. <laughs> but um, obviously, the therapy paid off, and then I wrote these songs. But um, no, I'm really proud of it because 
I co-produced a lot of songs on it for the first time. Um, I did just do what I wanted and I'm very lucky that, you know, I'm on a label that doesn't say your next album has to sound like your, your previous album so that people still buy it. You know, I was very honest to Lloyd and said, I don't know if anyone like that liked Impossible Stuff will like this album, you know? But actually, the support has blown me away. Um, and everyone's been so kind and, and, and wonderful about the singles and the album now that it's out that I'm sort of, like, shocked, really. Well, it's, I mean, it's totally worth it. It's a great record. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, the other collaboration, I, I, there might be more that I don't know, but uh, Waves That Fall. Yeah. Tell me about that one. And so uh, Solar Eye, or real name Dave Hook, is the singer in this uh, rap hip-hop band in Scotland called Stanley Odd, who are just outstanding. They're just releasing their first new music in six years, and they've been sorely missed, like, live they blow you away and it's just that great marriage of like poetic lyrics with a good humor and soul to them you know and um i just had written this track and like because i was going down this pop route i was like oh remember you used to get pop tracks that would like feature like a rap kind of break down and i was like i'm gonna do that why not what's stopping me nothing and um i thought right i'm gonna ask dave and i'll approach dave to do it and um and he said yes, which I was blown away. And then I sent him the track. It had this section that was free for him to do, but he sent me back his demo and he put these lovely call and response bits on the verses and the chorus. And I said, like, wow, this is a full blown duet now. This is great. We've just caught it in a track. And um, I was so pleased he did it. And, you know, there's a big debate and pretend to know the full dealings of it about your accent, the Scottish accent within hip hop. And quite often I've been told like, you know, you sing in a Scottish accent, like if you sang in another accent, your music would maybe have more appeal and stuff like that. Um, so I thought it was quite interesting to put both our voices together. And then because it's like both our sort of like accents together, it sounds kind of like normal, you know, it does, it just, mm. I don't know, it just kind of fitted and it, it felt quite nice doing it. And um, I really think the lyrics that he wrote for that song are just really beautiful and thoughtful. And um, yeah, it's just, it's always nice when you approach someone that you're a fan of and say, will you work with me? And they turn around and said, I would, I would love to, you know? Yeah. yeah. I, I love the fact that you sing in a Scottish accent. I mean, it's your voice. I, yeah, I mean, I mean, my, my talking accent is very broad, so I don't know how I would hide it, to be honest. I remember, like, growing up, Jesus and Mary Jane were my favorite band when I was a teenager mm -hmm. in my 20s, and when I heard interviews with them, I could never understand what they are saying, but then it was like... Well, that happens to me all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so, the last two songs, we talked about... Uh, thorns before but coming up daisies as well these two just have huge choruses yeah yeah um yeah thorns was it was just one of those weird songs that i wrote late one night uh, when i was still living at my mum's actually uh for a brief period of time and i had my little cord mini pops drum machine and a, a vintage reed organ and uh, it was just doing this sort of wee riff between a D and a G. And, and then the song just sprang out from there, to be honest. And I just kept layering up the demo and just did it without thinking about it, like a kind of free writing exercise. Um, and it's almost like sometimes if you don't think about it, the best ideas happen, you know? And then with Coming Up Daisies, it was similar. Like I had this sort of like chord sequence for the verse and the verse came really easy. And then when I went to the chorus, I just kind of went into this sort of classic chord progression, you know, that's quite 60s with the minor. And um, I thought, oh, this, I'm just quite, I just enjoy singing it and playing it on the piano, you know, and um, 
when we were recording that, it was in this big church. It's the only song recorded in this big church venue. There's all this natural reverb. Um, so there's no plugins on it. And like, nice. they just, my drummer was just doing this little beat. And I was like, just do that the whole way through. Like, like don't change the beat the whole way through, you know? And he was like, that's not going to work. And I was like, it will, because like the, the synths can make it bloom and all this. And um, but I love that. When we did the vocal take for that song, it was my first take as the take on the record. Nice. Because all the fairy lights were on and the light was pouring in these big stained glass windows and the producer was up on this balcony and my vocals going through a 400 year old bell tower to get that lovely natural reverb and it was just such a wonderful environment to sing that you just enjoyed doing it, you know, so like I did it and then I was like, well, I'll do it again. Stephen was like, nope, that's, that's the take. <laughs> but um, I just, I, I mean... I guess those two songs are the big sonic ones in the album. Just again, my love of like Spectre productions kind of coming through and just kind of applying that to kind of like a modern pop sound, really. Mm. Yeah, I noticed that about the drums, and I was like, this is huge. Yeah. <laughs> so how, how many songs did you write while you were homeless, <laughs> couch surfing? Um. Quite a lot. I mean, I was in a position where I could pick what would go on my album and I could pick what I would record, and um, which was, was quite nice. But, I mean, it's just quite therapeutic, I think, to just fill a notebook full of notes and and then all of a sudden you go back through and you're like, oh, there's a song idea there or there's one to take through or whatever. I think writing is such a wonderful way to help you work yourself, work stuff out, you know? So, yeah, just, well, I started therapy at the same time, so the two kind of went hand in hand, really. Nice. Mm -hmm. You did some Zoom gigs, was it last month? Uh, I can't, I don't even know what day it is anymore. Some point <laughs> summer, yeah, <laughs> we're seeing it sometime this year. How, how did those go? Because you had a, a tour schedule? Uh, no, it was just that, like, again, it was like I was thinking, I would have been gigging if I was promoting my album and I'd had some shows booked for the year, you know? I couldn't do it. And um, I'd done the odd live stream on Facebook, but it actually really exacerbated my anxiety. <laughs> um, and I really missed the community of a gig, you know, like when you meet people at a, a show or, um, you know, you can talk to the support act or whatever. So I thought, well, if I do a Zoom tour, then everyone that's there can meet each other in the audience, which is quite, you can quite often meet people at gigs, you know, and they become your friend or yeah. you just have a chat with them and, I could talk to the support act and and um, it just, it felt so nice. I just, the feeling I had afterwards just was like, oh, the music community is still there and I can see them and partake in it. And um, I just really, really enjoyed it. You know, I mean, it's still that thing where you're like, oh, the audio is a bit compressed or sometimes the image is sticking, but I was really thankful for those that bought tickets to, to come to it, you know, and there was a few people that bought a ticket for one night and they enjoyed it so much they came the next night, you know, and um, and it was nice to, like, sort of introduce my fan base to Malka or Lemon Drink and, um, and much in the way that you would do that if it was a gig, you know, you'd, or I would join someone's lineup. Or, so, yeah, I really enjoyed it. It was good. It was good for the soul. Nice. So what does the future hold? Do you have any plans coming up? Um, fuck. I mean, I'd love, to, I'd love to play this record live. You know, I mean, people are tentatively, like, working out how that will work out with social distancing and venues, you know? I mean, 
by next year for sure I'm playing two festivals I've got Stag and Dagger in May in Edinburgh and then Indie Fjord in Norway um, in July um, so I guess it'll just be like working out when stuff's happening and maybe booking a tour around that in the meantime I'm just writing you know still writing um, I've got a project with one of my friends that I'm working on um, that we've been doing some recording and writing for. And I've been going back into the studio with Scott once a week to write. And it's just so nice to be able to do that again. I'm just so thankful to be able to do that because I love it. Mm. Norway sounds exciting. You've been there before? Yeah. I mean, I went, I played in Fjord in 2017 with uh, Teen Canteen and it's just this idyllic, setting in the middle of nowhere by a fjord surrounded by mountains and waterfalls and the capacity of the festivals like 300 at a push you know like it's in this town where like the population's eight um and it's just so amazing and like it doesn't get dark at that time of year it's like constant daylight and sunshine and you can hike up this waterfall and eat fresh picked wild blueberries on the way and um oh it's just magical so I'm so excited to to go back and take my band and go back as a solo artist and just amazing to have something like that to look forward to. Yeah that sounds like it. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Well that's all my questions you got anything else you want to add? Um no I'm just say uh, honestly blown away by everyone's support for this record and I was so nervous about releasing it I didn't know what I'd like <laughs> um, so yeah it's good it's good thank you so much for coming on thank you thanks for having me